Hello and welcome to Dialogue. Developing new productive forces has become a recent catchphrase in China's policy making and is high among the priorities for this year's economic work. Besides traditional industries becoming smarter and more innovative, there is also the rapid development of strategic emerging industries and future industries such as new energy and quantum technology. All of this innovation is causing a very noticeable shift in China's economic landscape. How should we interpret the concept of new productive forces? Will they replace traditional industries? And how will they change the landscape of China's economic structure and contribute to growth? Join us for our discussion from Beijing. I'm Xu Qinduo. Joining me today are Professor Kao Fei from BI Norwegian Business School in Oslo, Wang Yaojing, Assistant Professor in Economics of Peking University, and He Wei Wen from the Center for China and Globalization. Welcome to Dialogue. So Yaojing, I will start with you. So what is the definition of the new productive forces? What does it refer to? Well, well, President Xi mentioned that the new productive forces is categorized by innovation and uh, uh, quality improvement. So, um, and it's also characterized by the total productivity um, being increased instead of just pouring in labor and capital inputs, but the innovation and, and this quality increasement is, is bringing the efficiency up uh, besides just, just giving in more inputs. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Her, what's your understanding, what's your interpretation of this uh, new phrase, you know, uh, new productive forces here? What is new? It's compared to tradition. Uh, the tradition of productive forces have been stayed for centuries. But now we have to advance to a new productive forces that may measured by the added value created by the production forces. The traditional production forces, of, of course, create a lot of value. It's not enough. Far from reaching our goal, so we have to advance the productive uh, productivity. Means the higher laborer and the higher productive tools. So as they combine, so for instance, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, new energy, and big data, so as to create a much higher added value than traditional industries. Mm -hmm. uh, but let me, you know, uh, put this question to Yao Jing again. Uh, if you look at the new production, uh, productive forces, the new phrase or the stress here, uh, how, how do you describe, you know, how do you define, what are the features, you know, how is, how is it different from, say, traditional uh, productive forces there? Well, yes, um, I think there are three dimensions there. Uh, one is that traditionally we've been uh, pouring labor and capital and building and those inputs, and that would reach a, a plateau, um, which we are, this is what the phase we're facing now is that uh, we're reaching this plateau that is the marginal uh, benefit from pouring resources is, is very limited. And, and so we have to increase the total factor productivity is that without pouring those resources, we can still uh, increase our efficiency. And the second uh, dimension is that is the innovation versus just copy imitation, right? And the third dimension is quality instead of uh, quantity in the traditional uh, way. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, Mr. He, you know, we know that uh, President Xi mentioned, you know, uh, this phrase during the inspection a tour to the uh, north uh, eastern part of China in Heilongjiang. This is a, you know, a little background of this uh, phrase of being mentioned. Uh, so he talked about uh, you know new energy, new material, and high tech manufacturing uh, as industries that should have become new productive forces there. Uh, so does it have something to do with uh, say the revitalization of the north eastern part of China or? Let's say, uh, does it have something to do probably with this, this larger background of the Chinese uh, economic slowdown? You know, of course, it is continue to grow, but uh, the growth is uh, slowing down. It refers to the advancement of the traditional industries in northeast of China, which is a traditional industrial base of the country. Still, it has a larger uh, perspective covering the whole country, looking forward for the future. Because the prime importance of this, goal, this uh, slogan is, I think, 
for by the year 2035, China will become a medium developed economy. That means if we measure the, the world measure uh, the medium developed economies, we should find out that the, their per capita GDP is around the twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars. China last year was only twelve point five thousand dollars. So we have to double our per capita GDP. The only way is to raise our total factor productivity. That means we should only, the only way is to rely on new quality, new productive forces. Uh, the total uh, labor productivity of China, uh, according to the Groningen University of Netherlands, was eleven point seven dollars per man hour in 2022, while in the United States it's seventy seven dollars. And in Germany, France, six to eight dollars. So we have at least to double our per hour output to twenty five or thirty dollars at least to become a medium developed economy. So the only way is to raise productivity tremendously. The only way is to rely on higher technology, artificial intelligence, big data, new energy, and new materials, the quantum computing, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. In terms of policy making, I'm wondering you know, what does it require uh, to grow those, uh, let's say, new frontier, uh, let's say, science and technology. I mean, you know, for the government, the central government and the provisional uh, government or local government, um, uh, their policy making, what they need to do. Uh, I think first of all, we have to carefully follow the latest developments of the world not only to work by closed doors, we should find out each industry, each advanced, advanced industry's development status in different parts of the world, especially in the most developed advanced economy, United States. Then we should find out the gap, the true gap, and the pathway to reach, the, to reach that level. I think the important thing is, the government should spend should spend a lot of money to support innovation, research and development of the basic research, and leaving most of the job, the innovation to the market, to the private industries, to private. We should rely heavily on the corporate innovation instead of mere government money, and the government money and the support measures should also very important, be in compliance with the WTO rules, no discrimination, supporting all the economy, all the enterprises, SOEs, private or foreign in China. Mm -hmm. Kao, you earlier mentioned about, uh, you know, uh, in the past, probably for a developing country like China, uh, it's probably easier to follow and copy even. But nowadays, probably when you are entering the new stage of this new technology, new innovation, probably there's um, very, very few or very little to follow. You have to do it on yourself. Um, you know, previously people would call that, you know, late move advantage. And now probably uh, we can create some, you know, probably first mover advantage. Uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, China needs to be a first mover advantage and there are a number of things that they can do to get that. Uh, one thing that I think the government has done a pretty good job on historically is focusing on some areas. In other words, saying the battery industry, for example, China very early recognized that this was going to be critical for electric vehicles and electric vehicles more broadly are two areas that China really focused on early. When I think some places in the world were still wondering, is this actually going to really be as big as some people think? This has benefited China tremendously. But one thing China's not done a very good job of, in, for example, the electric battery industry, is it's fairly distributed across the country. And we know from Michael Porter's theory of clusters that there's a lot of benefits to be gained from being co-located so that other related industries develop around that and uh, you have uh, more universities developing to get good high quality uh, learning, et cetera, high quality workforce. So one thing I think that could be done is a little more concentration uh, following this cluster approach. It has been done well by the Chinese government in many other ways, like free economic zones, et cetera, but uh, I think there's some focus that could be done there. The second thing is changing the education system to be more about innovative thinking and creativity. I think this really is uh, is needed. And, and the third thing is to continue to encourage and incentivize 
uh, companies to invest a lot in R&D. You need R&D. China's doing very well in this. They actually had R&D output grow in 2002 by about 10 percent. Uh, they invested more in 10 uh, percent uh, more in uh, R&D than the, the year before. And most of this, about 90 percent of this, is from companies, not from the government. So some people critique around the world, oh, the government is all that drives R&D in China. Actually, companies are investing a lot. You look at companies like uh, Huawei, which has invested much more than its competitors now for almost two decades. Uh, and that's one of the reasons they've seen some recent successes. Mm -hmm. uh, Carl, are you suggesting that, you know, on the government side, of course, they have their role to play uh, in terms of policy making, in terms of uh, issuing guidelines, um, but for the companies, individual firms, uh, so they have their own uh, probably priority or their own role to play, for example, as you mentioned, to invest more in R&D? Both of these things are needed, both the government support uh, and uh, the company actions. Of course, company actions can be influenced by government, for example, giving some discount if you are investing more in R&D as a company. And the government has other roles to play, such as something you mentioned before, which is uh, the need for good intellectual property protection. China has improved tremendously on this in the last years. In fact, most people around the world outside of China don't recognize how much it has improved. And so this might be something that China would want to look at uh, to encourage people and companies to invest more in R&D so that they know and are confident that their intellectual property will be protected. And so that foreign companies, when they come to China, will recognize and feel comfortable that their intellectual property will be protected. And there, maybe the biggest thing is not actually doing further things, but advertising how good intellectual property protection has advanced in China, because most people around the world really don't recognize the current state. They're thinking about a state of intellectual property protection a decade ago. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Yao Jing, you know, uh, as far as I know, you know, in the Chinese uh, colleges and universities, you do see progress being made uh, to encourage students to be more creative, to be more innovative. But what else do we need to do in order to, say, catch up with or meet the demand or the expectation of this uh, new stage and new productive forces here? Um, I think what the Chinese government has been doing uh, uh, with education is that it has been constantly adapting to uh, the market demand from the education side. For example, um, the Ministry of Education has been constantly reforming to cooperate with the national industrial strategies. They've been locating uh, universities in, in areas that would need those uh, uh, majors. They need to say engineers. They will be locating engineering schools or, or, or majors into those areas. Um, and also the, like the STEM program for uh, strengthening basic academic disciplines is one of the most significant uh, uh, reform to build a, a strong talent force in science and innovation. And China is by far the country with the most STEM graduates. I think the 2020 number is 3.5 million graduates uh, compared to 2.5 million for India and an 820 for the United States. So back to your question um, of what can they do to further like uh, in, like to uh, strengthen their creativity, I think that is to, to work more with the industry instead of just uh, within the academic areas, because I think academic areas, we focus on uh, things that are could be slightly different from what the industries or what the uh, uh, real world uh, would be interested in. So I think that what the actual uh, impact that your uh, research can bring to the reality could be also considered one of your, um, say, your academic achievements uh, by the university. So when it's the university's standards for talents is cooperating these uh, real world impact, I think it's, it creates these incentives for uh, the researchers to uh, gear toward their research towards uh, more uh, applications. Mm -hmm. Domestically, uh, we we are have seeing the trouble in the property market, for example, and of course, you know, uh, uh, export is uh, slowing down. And uh, then, you know, uh, externally, we do have the U.S. competition. Uh, you know, this is uh, the, the phrase they use against China. You know, when they come to specific policies, for example, there's export ban of this advanced chips to China, of course, the scrutiny of investment in China, things like that, you know, they, they are you know, the factors affecting the Chinese uh, economic performance. Uh, against such a background, you know, 
the new productive forces is, is raised. Um, what's the relationship here? You know, how can such a concept, such a focus, uh, can help us overcome probably those challenges? Yes, good question. Uh, of course, the new concept, new productive forces, is raised uh, just on time. Uh, at a very complicated background, both at home and abroad. At home, as I just mentioned, that by 2035, we have to hit the goal of the medium developed economy. So we have a double our per capita GDP and our labor productivity. So as the only way is the new quality, uh, new productive forces. And at the background, we can also find that China already accounts for 30% of total world manufacturing industry. So just by expanding further the manufacturing industry, we have only limited room left. The only way is to go up the ladder, advance to the advanced level of the adopting the highest cutting edge technologies of the world, so as to raise our productivity tremendously. That's the only way to hit that goal of becoming a medium developed economy by 2035. And against the background of the complicated international environment, now the, because of the increasing geopolitical segmentation and geoeconomic fragmentation, and we also are faced with the very strong restrictions from the United States and to a lesser extent from Europe. And the U.S., uh, the Washington's uh, concept, a uh, small yard, a high fence, but the yard is huge, not small. And so faced with this difficult situation, we have to advance to the new quality, uh, new productive forces in cooperation with the world, open our doors, cooperate with the world uh, by opening up uh, further and further to break the small yard and high fence. Carl, if you look at China, you know, China, as you said, China has been doing this uh, with a focus on innovation, on technology, science uh, for quite a long time. It has been successful in some areas, for example, in the uh, electric vehicle, you know, uh, lithium battery, solar products, etc. Uh, so is there any experience China can learn in terms of a further develop probably uh, this new productive forces here? Um, so indeed, uh, China has uh, been uh, successful in a number of areas, in quite a few areas. Uh, but I think the, the, the next step is to focus on innovation broadly, uh, not just in a, a few limited areas, but to really make this a central point of what China is doing in all different areas and to show greater confidence. I actually think some of the challenge that China has is confidence. Uh, so, you know, China, for example, often is copying the management practices that people have in other companies, in other countries, I'm sorry. But China is starting now to develop some of their own management practices as well. We think of China as being very hierarchical. We often say for innovation, we need to have decentralization. China has come up with a really interesting thing recently in several companies that uh, is starting to be called <laughs> digitally uh, enhanced uh, directed autonomy. Uh, that's extreme decentralization that we see in companies like Hire, where they have these micro enterprises, uh, or where we see in, in companies um, like uh, Hondu, uh, that they have uh, teams designing clothing, uh, where they're quite independent in their sales, their design, and their production of clothing. But what's different from what's happening in the West when you have this extreme decentralization is that in China, you have the goals being set by the top management and you have very tight control and you have this digital platform that is sharing a lot of information. One of the things that China has done great but can do even more with is the use of digital tools to support in the innovation process and the working of companies. And I think we're gonna see a lot of really interesting innovations happening in that moving forward. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Mr. He, if you look at this, uh, we talked about the role by the market and by the government in terms of uh, developing or, you know, with the concept uh, new productive forces. Uh, uh, of course, when it comes to the role of the government, and for example, you know, uh, it's a very uh, controversial sometimes. Some of the practices like uh, this uh, uh, industrial policies or uh, subsidies by the government. Uh, um, you know, what's the next step, you know, uh, for the Chinese government to do it in a way that is also in line with the, let's say, WTO required practice at the same time that is effective? Uh, I think uh, industrial policies as a general 
phenomena across the world. Many countries are applying or strengthening industrial policies by government to support the new emerging advanced technologies. So WTO is going or is should do a good job, big job is to renovate and upgrade the standard regulations for industrial policies. Because we WTO does have regulation on industrial policy that's far remoted because the technologies are advancing so rapidly. All, all the existing WTO rules might be outdated. We have to advance, update. That's a big task for WTO. And in the country level, national level, we should apply industrial policy to support a new emerging industries without any doubt. But the important thing is non-discrimination should be free, open, fair to all economies, all players, without discrimination, without uh, any, say, yard or like-minded uh, uh, partners forming a supply chain and to excluding some others, uh, not in a like-minded camp, that would be wrong. So industrial policy should be equal, should be fair. Uh, Carl, what do you see are challenges, you know, for the Chinese companies or for the Chinese economy uh, in terms of uh, uh, to further, let's say, uh, explore and develop the new productive forces? So President Xi and many people now in China are talking about new productive forces. I think Chinese companies need to work to develop new productive brands to complement the new productive forces. When we talk about going abroad, Chinese brands, unfortunately, are still not as well known as they should be. The technology is ahead of the reputation and of the brand. Uh, so this is one area that really needs work. One thing that could really help with that is that state-owned enterprises are often you know, very large companies in China what we might call almost an industry in some other countries. Uh, and sometimes the subsidiaries in a state-owned enterprise are rather independent and see as their greatest competitors other subsidiaries that are part of the state-owned enterprise. Sometimes they don't work as well together as they could in positioning themselves when they're meeting foreign companies. Uh, and I think there could be perhaps um, some uh, additional encouragement uh, from the government that uh, these uh, state-owned enterprises truly work together as one company and not a group of other companies. It's hard because they're so large. This is easy to say, a lot harder to do. But this could also help with making a whole lot of efficiency savings in how one organizes the R&D, not to have too much duplication and different subsidiaries, et cetera. So working on the brand and working on the collaboration of state-owned enterprise parts together, I think are two areas that can really help make the new productive forces go to the next level. Well, reform of the SOEs there. Uh, Yao Jing, you know, if you look at the China's investment in high-tech manufacturing, uh, as we earlier mentioned, uh, they grew by nearly 10% last year. Uh, but if you look at the output of the entire high-tech manufacturing sector, uh, it grew by less than 3%. Why is that? Well, there are two folds to that. Uh, one fold is that, like I mentioned before, that investment, especially R&D investment, takes time to become outputs and then eventually become uh, uh, profits. So uh, it has been the case for all high-tech companies making the breakthrough, especially in, in their starting phases. Uh, uh, Apple, Tesla, they all have been through this uh, this phase. And, and the second fold to that is that uh, output is one dimension of uh, production, right? And we have quality, as we mentioned, is one of the uh, uh, characteristics of this uh, new productive force is that uh, increasing uh, quality and an increase in this, this value that's added to it is is another fold that should be measured um, um, to be the output of the uh, of the R&D. So, um, so that's why we mentioned that is that the investor confidence and investor patience um, should be very important to foster these kind of real innovation. And if investors and managers are short-sighted and focus on short-term uh, outputs and revenues, it will be very difficult for industries to make truly profound breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Mr. Her, last words, uh, what needs to be done uh, probably to 
uh, uh, further you know, unleash uh, uh, that the new productive forces uh, uh, so as to deal with all the, let's say, the slow down the economy, probably all the, uh, the, the drivers, for example, some of the previous drivers, the like property market, or some of the challenges domestically, uh, aging society, you know, low birth, etc., uh, by relying on this, by unleashing these uh, new productive forces. Uh, yes, I think the, uh, the fundamental way for China's economy is to, is to rely on new productive forces. And uh, there are many policies and many uh, perspectives uh, to be mentioned. I would like to mention two points, among others. First, we should energetically encourage the corporate innovation on indigenous innovation, not the general, the innovation in general, because China is pretty good at from one to n, but relatively weak from zero to one. That's indigenous innovation is relatively weak. We are pretty strong, pretty, very strong in solar energy and solar panels, in lithium cells, and also new electrical vehicles. They are not indigenous innovation. We have to do that. Indigenous innovation, we have to create a very good innovation ecology, especially for cooperation. That's the first point. The second point, we should foster a sophisticated, well-governed capital market to support corporate innovation. On that note, we come to the end of today's discussion. Many thanks to our guests. You can also follow us on the CGTN app on YouTube. I'm Xu Xinduo. Thanks for being with us. See you next time.